Okay, for your head. Okay, page 897, Psalm 100. Okay. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. 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 You know, it's a... Don't you just enjoy hearing the word of God? I mean, I'm preaching the sermon today and I, even, and I know the passage that I'm preaching from and I hear it again and I'm like, God, I just... Yeah, and if you ever want to really get serious about your prayer life, the Psalms is a great place to be. You know, meditate on the Psalms. Psalms are just wonderful because they really express uh, our heart. You know, and uh, am I, you can't see me there, Kathy. I realize I've we have all this video technical stuff, and poor Kathy has to go like this. You shouldn't have to go like that, Kathy. There you go. Um, you know, it's just wonderful to be able to pray the Psalms and to, to learn them that way and to use them in our spiritual life, you know, uh, because uh, many times you don't, you know, you don't know what to pray. And uh, sometimes the Psalms just helps you to get out what's in there. And, uh, you know, and the more you get to know Psalms, the better you are knowing, you know, what Psalms to go to, to, to express the, you know, and, and just let, you can begin with the Psalm and then let the Psalm carry you into your own prayers before the Lord. As, uh, as we begin to, uh, this week, get ready for Thanksgiving, uh, you know, a lot of people will be traveling. Maybe some are not here because they are traveling and they're on the way to be with their family somewhere else. And uh, so a lot of people do that. And uh, one of the great things about traveling is they, they get to go back home for where they're from. And, you know, when you get back home from where you're from, you always have like familiar surroundings. As soon as that plane starts to land and you say, you realize, oh, you recognize those buildings or that or, or, or that uh, cathedral or this thing or that thing. It's just amazing. And then you go through the gates. You have to go through all the issues of getting out of there. And then you finally go into the very familiar places. And then especially if you go into your mom's house, especially um, the familiar smells. And once you go into like your mom's house and you're used to like how things smell, just all those smells bring back so many memories. So many years, so many things, so many wondrous uh, times. Well, the same thing was in the ancient world. On the ancient world, of course, they had these gates that they had to go through to go into a city. But again, once you were in the city, not only did you feel safe because you were in the city, you also had all those memories. And for the Jewish people especially, it was very deep because it was just, just like, oh, we're coming to have a festival. Well, in the ancient world, everybody had a god. But for them, of course, it was the presence of the Holy One there with them. And so when they went in, they smelled and sometimes they got near the temple. They knew they were near the presence of the Holy One. And it just brought a, a jubilance inside of them, uh, wanting to celebrate, wanting to be thankful. And that's what this psalm is about. Uh, you know, ironically, for us as Christians, we should be even more thankful than the Jews ever were. I don't have to travel to Jerusalem to be in the presence of God. I don't have to go to the temple, even though it's no longer standing, or even the wailing wall. I don't have to be there to be in the presence of God. The presence of God is in me. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that should make us even more thankful, even more worshipful, because we realize at any moment, any, any, any time, we can stop and thank the Lord and praise Him and be aware of His presence within our lives. And this psalm calls us to worship. It calls us to be thankful. That's why when we were doing the little thing, crossword, I knew it was Psalm 100. I was like, yeah, that's what I'm preaching on. What does worship mean? I know what it means. I've been working on this. Um, but here it gives us actually seven commands about how we are to come into the presence of the Lord. Again, even though it's coming to the presence of the Lord, there are commands. Here are things you must do if you really want to be in the presence of God. And the first command we find is in verse 1. 
Shout for joy to the Lord. Shout to joy. You know, shout for joy to the Lord. You know, the, the sound of a trumpet sound. You know, something jubilant, something uh, celebration, something wondrous. You know, some people, when they come into the presence of God, somehow like they, they get altered. You know, whisper unto the Lord. You know, they can watch a football game and they're like, hey! or baseball, in my case. Oh, my goodness. Although I don't really panic much on baseball. This this World Series was easy because the Yankees weren't playing. So I'm just more like, oh, I'm hoping the Rangers win first World Series. hope they get it. But there was not really any emotional outburst. If the Yankees were playing, I'd be like, oh, oh, come on, oh, oh, you know, the all emotions. Uh, and yet we come into the temple, we come into the presence of God here to worship together. And also we come very prim, very proper. Yeah. Let's not shout unto the Lord. You know, it's like, no, you celebrate, shout, be, you know, we don't have, we don't have to treat it like a funeral. You know, some people treat worship like a funeral. Oh, let's go worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've given us. And, and I'm sure God's in heaven going, stop it, just just stop it. Please stop it. You know, it, you know, come on. And doesn't have to be also the other extreme. You know, people always go to extremes, you know, and I don't mean like the Billy Joel songs, but you know, everybody goes to extremes. I don't know why, you know, I've been in services where it's just the very opposite, where it's like, it just looks crazy. I've been in Pentecostal churches where I was like, it looks like the insane asylum. The inmates have been let loose. And you see, you know, I was, I was be sitting there going, wow, I, 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 I know I should be focused on worshiping here, Lord, but it's very distracting. You have a guy who's in his 50s running around. Imagine if you had a man right now running around, you know, and I, all I kept thinking was, he's in pretty good shape. 50-year-old running around like that's pretty good. I don't know if I could do that, you know. Then you have a woman trying to dance, and I do mean trying to dance because you can tell she probably doesn't know how to dance to begin with, and her spiritual dance doesn't look any better probably than her secular dance. And then you have a guy who's on the floor having like an epileptic attack. And I keep looking at him thinking, I think he's having an epileptic attack. And I'm thinking, if this service stops, if we stop worshiping and he's still doing this, we call 911, okay? I call 911. Although I think back then we didn't have cell phones. So, you know, it's like somebody call for help because we're in trouble here. And if you've never been at Pentecostal church, always go there cautiously because you never know what to expect. I was one time at a worship service. I was about 17. Thank God I was 17. Now she would really, she would have damaged me. But I was 17 years old and I was worshiping. Hey, wow, you know, I was praising God and there was nothing weird going on. So I thought, cool. So I raised my hands to worship. Biggest mistake of my life. Lady grabs me by the shoulder. Black lady behind me. I'm like, I got put my hands out fast. Maybe she'll stop. She did, thank God. If not, I was just going to lie down on the floor like I was slain in the spirit. I was going to do something because I was like, she hurt me. I'm 17 years old. She hurt me, man. So, you know, uh, so that's the extreme. We don't have to go to that extreme, but we can worship the Lord and be thankful. There's nothing wrong with an amen. There's nothing wrong with that. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with shouting. There's nothing wrong with praising. There's nothing wrong with getting louder. Uh, you know, this, again, we go to extremes. It has to be like mayhem or funeral. No, the happy medium where we can do, you know, and just worship God. And again, if you feel like worshiping God by being a little louder, by raising your hands, whatever, praise God. Sure. That's the freedom that we have in the presence of God. But we are to shout unto the Lord that sense of the fact that we have come to his presence. You know, I always sense that. And thank God my daughter's not here because that's you. I always talk about my daughter. But, you know, when when my daughter and I meet, it's like we haven't met billions of years. It's always that expression of joy between us that we see each other. Me, she'll go off today to do her Chinese homework and stuff like that in Chinese school. And then she'll come back and it's just like, you know, hi, Papa. You know? That's exactly what happens. We come to the presence of God. Abba, Father. You know, we're worshiping together. We're so grateful that we're in his presence. That we're, we, I mean, how do you react to the, to the one that you love? You know, and, and this is the way it should be. Shout unto the Lord. Come into his presence. And then he goes on and gives us two more commands. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. You know, to worship. The, the word worship means to worship, adore, serve. If you worship God, you will serve him. You want to dispel ingratitude? You want to have gladness? Then be glad for all that he's done for you. Come into his presence with that gladness. Sometimes we, we treat gladness like a rare thing. Like, oh, maybe today I'll walk into his presence with gladness. Well, the Bible says, no. Every time you come to worship God, come to worship him with gladness. Celebrate the things that he's done for you. No, not like an obligation. Oh, I have to go, thank God. Oh, 
all that he's done for me. Again. You know? Or like a ritual. Let's all become, you know, a ritual. Like, oh, we praise and we thank you, but we really, our heart is not there. We're really not thankful. God has done so much for us. We should be thankful. He delivered us from sin. How many wondrous things the Lord has done. If we really sat down honestly and counted all the things that we have claimed, not that somebody else told us God did for us, that we have said, God did this for me. How could we not be glad, not rejoice, worship glad, gladly before the Lord? And not because you have to, but because you want to. Here's a, new, a news flash. God doesn't need your praise. He doesn't need your worship. God knows how cool he is. You know, he knows how great he is. <laughs> he knows how wonderful he is. And like Jesus said, if you don't worship him, the very stones are going to cry. Our very creation will have no choice but to shout out to the Lord because of his greatness. But he gives us the privilege of being able to come before him and to be glad. And if you are glad, if you worship him gladly, you will serve him gladly. How can you really worship God if you really don't serve him? If you don't really seek to do what he wants you to do? Uh, and there are so many ways we could do that. Now, first of all, we need to realize that when we serve the Lord, think about it that way. We are serving the Lord, not the pastor, not the church, not the deacons, not the trustees. Not You're serving God. If you can't do it that way again, don't do it. Stay home. You know, what is the New York Times says? Sunday was made for the New York Times. That's a nice pagan thing to say. Well, stay home, read the New York Times. Don't waste God's time. Don't waste your time. Do it unto the Lord. For because of what he's done, we serve God. And if we are serving God, then we don't need the praise of others. I don't need anyone to pat me on the head and go, oh, pastor, nice sermon. Oh, Pastor, you're just so great. I need the Lord to say, well done. You've done great, my son. You know, when I get up here, when I'm here to preach, I don't ask, oh, Lord, I hope people like my son. I say, Lord, let me honor you. Let me worship you. You know, you know that I'm an idiot in 10,000 million ways. <laughs> but please, when I'm there, let it all be for your glory. Let it, whatever comes through, let me, your Holy Spirit speaking to people what they need to hear. See, and so if you, whether you thank me or not won't matter because I do it for the Lord. Serve God. And there's so many ways we can serve the Lord. You know, certainly we can, we can sing. If you can sing, I can't sing. But if you can sing, praise God. Sing. You can play an instrument, play an instrument. You know, uh, disciple, evangelize, do all these things or help others. You know, recently there was a scam that went out in my name. Someone sent out another scam uh, asking for money for cancer patients, gift cards. Like I have ever done anything like that. First of all, I think I've only preached like five sermons this whole time that I've been a pastor on money. But I do preach on this. Remember the poor. Remember the poor. And when you're about to celebrate Thanksgiving, when you're about to celebrate Christmas, you're about to celebrate things, and you're so grateful for what God has done, remember the poor. And I'm not talking necessarily somebody in Africa. There are people here starving, people suffering. You know someone who has needs? Reach out to them financially. Take food to them. Maybe invite them to your table for Thanksgiving. You know? There are so many things we can do, but we should always, I mean, it shouldn't just be Thanksgiving. It shouldn't just be now. Always remember the poor. You know, I, I grew up poor. I, my mom raised three of us in poverty. I am grateful to God for what I have. And so when I can help others, I help others. And again, don't let your, your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Just do it. Not so somebody else sees you. Because again, you don't want the praise of man. You want the praise of God. You want to honor the Lord, even in helping the poor. But reach out to them in any way that you can and help them out. We can do so many things. Uh, so again, if, we're, if, we, if we want to praise God, if we want to worship Him, we need to rejoice. And these things are, entail rejoice. We also need to submit to Him. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. We are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. <clears throat> know the Lord. <clears throat> and ironically, you have to say that because not everybody wants to know the Lord. Do you really want to know God? Do you really want to come in his presence? You know, sometimes people say, oh, I really like to know the Lord. And you know, I know that if God were to show up, you would be afraid. 
You know, when I was young, when I was a young kid, must have been my my sister was about ten, so I must have been eleven, something like that. And we had gone to hospital because she had appendicitis. And I went to a chapel to pray. Never prayed in my life, you know, just little nominal Catholic boy. I don't know how to pray. And I was praying to God. And all of a sudden, I felt the presence of God there. Only I was terrified. I was not a Christian. All of a sudden, I'm there and somebody's there with me. And I'm like, oh, hey, hey, hey. I think that's how people feel when they pray. They pray, but they really don't want God to show up. Because <laughs> they might be terrified, you know, of how holy he is. And just like, just like uh, Isaiah, you realize, holy, holy, holy. Once you come into the presence of God, you realize he is holy. That means that I am unholy. He is clean. I am unclean. God, clean me. But we need to submit to him. We want to know him. We want to know everything about him. And people do want to know God, but they want to know him as savior, as friend, as father, as deliverer, as my buddy, you know. But he's also Lord. Lord means master, owner. We don't like that. And let me tell you so much. If he's not Lord of your life, he's not your savior. He's not your friend. He's not anything else. If he doesn't own you, then there's no relationship between you and him. He is Lord. Amen. And we have to honor him as Lord. We submit to him. He is the creator. He made us and not ourselves. And now you're like, well, that's a given. We all Christians should know that. But how quickly we forget. How quickly we forget. All of a sudden we, we start getting powerful. All of a sudden we start making money. All of a sudden we start, and we start thinking, it was my hand that did it. It was my ingenuity. Oh, how do I come up with these, with these ideas? Oh, because I'm so such a brainiac. Because I was so strong. And we need to go back to when the Lord found us. Poor, wretched, and naked. <laughs> when we had nothing and the Lord lifted us up. The Lord has blessed us. The Lord has given us things. But we start out thinking the Lord, thanking the Lord for everything. All of a sudden, before you know it, we're taking credit for it. He has created us. And he's also the one recreating us. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. To a likeness of his son. Like I heard one preacher saying, all, all Christians should walk around with a sign saying, under construction. You know, we're all under construction. He's working on all of us to build us, to make us. And so we're constantly being under the, the work of God. We are not self-made. You know, read 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, Paul acknowledging, what do we have that we have not received? Nothing. Everything we have is from the Lord. Even people say, well, it was my strength. Well, where did you get that strength from? Where do you get that health from? Who, who gives you the power to wake up in the morning? Who gives you the power to even be healthy? Because I tell you, there's a lot of people out there that don't, cannot get up in the morning. There are people that cannot do things. So where are you getting it from? The Lord has blessed you with it. So we thank him. Again, we submit to him because we know he, he, he is Lord. He is creator. And it also reminds us who we are. We are the sheep of his pasture. We're not the shepherd. We're the sheep. And sometimes a very good analogy because sheep can be very dumb animals. And when you see sheep do the dumbest things, you go, you know, look at sheep, right? They go, oh, it's so dumb. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We are. We are dumb. We tend to do the dumbest things. Leave us to ourselves and, and we destroy ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we constantly need to hear the voice of the shepherd and listen to him and follow him. You know, outside this place, we may try to carry ourselves differently thinking that we're self-made and look at all that we have accomplished and look at who I am and what I've done. I'm a CEO, I'm whatever. And we always outside these, but when we come in here, we come back into humility to be reminded that he made us. And hopefully, eventually that will sink in and we will take it with us to realize wherever we are, whatever capacity we have, uh, whether it's in our homes, in our job, wherever, it's because the Lord has made us that way. And so we need to submit to him. And finally, of course, to be, to be thankful. You want to dispel in gratitude? Be joyful, be glad, submit, and be thankful. It says, verse 5, for the Lord is good. I love that. Mm -hmm. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Oh, what a beautiful verse. Yes. You know, the promises of God to us. He is good. Why do I submit to God? Why am I submitting? Because he is good. I mean, even when I try to be good, I can never be as good as God. God is great. And yet sometimes people have this image of God as like he's a tyrant or a party pooper, the wrath, the evil. Ugh. No, God is good. Amen. God is good. And his love endures forever. 
You know, there's a whole psalm like that. Again, reading the psalms, there's a whole psalm like that. I'm not going to read the whole psalm to you, but I want to read a portion of it to you. Look, Psalm 136 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You know what? Let's do it like this. I'm going to see the first line. Then you say, his love endures forever. Let's do it like that. Perfect. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Amen. Amen. If you want to remind yourself, there's a way to remind yourself. He is good and his love endures forever. And the promise to him is like, I'm going to remember you. I'm going to remember your children. I'm going to remember your grandchildren. I'm going to remember your generations. I love that. Being a father now, it's even more meaningful to me. You know, but I want Abby to come to a place where it's not the God just of her father. It's her God. It's not what God did for my dad. And I saw God working his life. It's what God is doing for me now. You know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, one day it'll be the God of Jorge, Abby, and her children. That's what I want. And that's the faithfulness of God. Again, he is good. His love endures her. And he's faithful. Not just today. Not just today, yesterday. Forever. This is why we are grateful to the Lord. The fact that he is working in our lives. Dispel ingratitude. You want to dispel ingratitude? Go back to the psalm. Make the psalm maybe part of Thursday when you're celebrating your family. Have the psalm read. And say something you're thankful for. Or pay just the fact, look around the faces as you sit there and be thankful for all the Lord has done. You know, of course, we take one day to do this. But in reality, we should be doing this every single day. The Lord is good. His love endures forever. He is faithful to all generations. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. We thank you, Father, for being here for us in all that we need, Lord. And Father, even when we have thought that you were not there, you were there. Even when we said we have not felt you, you are there. You're always there. And we thank you for that. We, Lord, just... Bring us back to Psalms like this to be reminded of your goodness, of your love, of your mercy towards us. And when all that is said and done, how could we not sing glory and praise to your name? Hallelujah. Be praised in all that we do, Lord. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 43, uh, great is thy faithfulness. We do Amen. all three verses. <coughs> Summer and winter and spring
blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen.